All right, well, I'm calling it. We're officially started. Um, thanks everyone for joining in. My name is Mark Bowers. I am the founder and executive director of the Professional Development Consortium of Hampton Roads. Um, UCHR or the consortium or call it what you will. Um, we're all about providing um, affordable, accessible leadership education to the folks who run membership associations. So typically professional societies, uh, civic leagues, fraternal orders, and basically any other group of people, uh, nominally in the Hampton Roads area, who formally or informally gather around a common interest area. Um, there are plenty of places to go around town for leadership education, but nobody else um, provides a curriculum that is tuned to the particular challenges associated with being the volunteer leader, um, working with other volunteers on a let's do this after work <laughs> basis um, with uh, crazy resource constraints. So some of you have been with us before at other events. Um, some are here for the first time. Everybody uh, welcome very much to this. Uh, we try and keep our sessions you know, reasonably informal. Um, we provide uh, several types of education, um, but the ones that are most prevalent uh, are, are, are workshops like we have today where we bring in a commercial and or uh, academic expert to um, guide the participants through some learning. And we also do roundtables um, where we gather folks who um, serve a similar functional role like treasurers or membership directors and uh, teach them how to have a structured conversation um, to bring everybody together. Because that's an important part, I think, of education is connecting with peers, um, learning about other folks' uh, challenges as well. So um, with that, I am going to turn the floor over to our uh, distinguished presenter today, Dr. Karen Sanzo uh, from, uh, from Old Dominion University. Um, she's here uh, with us in partnership with ODU's uh, Strom Entrepreneurial Center. So with that, Karen, um, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. It is really nice to have all of you here and please feel free to have your cameras up. It's nice to see faces, but I understand too, if your cameras aren't on, I am going to have you go into breakout groups a couple times. So hopefully your microphones are working. So we'll be able to have you um, talk a little bit. I do have the simplest of simplest agendas for you. And that link is in the chat box, but don't worry if you can't access that we are, uh, Mark's gonna send out information to you all in the next couple of days that's going to link to the various tools and exercises that we'll be doing here and a copy of the PowerPoint that I'm going to share right now. So let me pull that up and then I'll do a little more introducing of myself and then we'll launch into the workshop. So as Mark said, I'm Karen Sanzo and I'm a faculty member at Old Dominion University. I'm actually starting my 15th year at Old Dominion. And um, prior to that, I spent eight years working in the public schools. I was um, an administrator and prior to that, I was a teacher. And currently I'm on faculty for the Ed Leadership Program and I'm the program coordinator for that. We work with K-12 educators who wanna be administrators, policy makers, faculty. And I'm also finishing up a two year provost fellow position where I was the provost fellow for design thinking and strategic planning. I do a lot of work with organizations outside of Old Dominion, specifically around organizational development, problem identification, problem solving, facilitating small and large groups, and also working with organizations to help them design and facilitate meetings, again, small or large, based upon whatever it is they might want to do. Um, anything from computer science to working with Norfolk government, um, employees to working with higher education universities, the Wallace Foundation. And so um, I share all that because I really love what I do. And I want you to consider me to be a resource, just like Old Dominion and Strom Entrepreneurial Center is a resource. I'm a free resource that you can reach out to if you have any questions at the conclusion of today's workshop. In part, I'm going to throw a lot of information out at you. It's going to be pretty simple and straightforward, but 
if, if you're like me, I need to hear it multiple times. I like to hear it once and then I like to break down the pieces with people. And, and um, I think Nancy and Sharon can tell you in particular, they have lots of conversations with me where I'm trying to ask points of clarification. And then um, taking some of these strategies and putting them into action, I, I would be happy to help you facilitate that process. Again, serving as a free resource, especially in this era of having these Zoom meetings, sometimes that's a bit of a challenge. And so I, I would be glad to talk with you offline after today, if any of this meets your interest. So our goals for the next 90-ish minutes is going to talk about innovation and change for your organization and then to explore and understand practical organizational tools for innovation. So these are ones that you can immediately put into use in your organization leaving here today. Now, um, I took a look at all of the registrants who wanted to attend today in all of your various needs. And I believe I've, I've landed on a topic, this case that you um, represented when you registered that is cross cutting and it may not spit, uh, fit your specific needs for this workshop, but I think it will fit you overall. We have people who are interested in funding, increasing membership, advancing ideas into action, and then not creating more ideas to support your original ideas. I think these tools in particular will help you with that challenges of remote work, challenges of remote recruitment, understanding your product development, identifying the right products and then positioning those products within, within the area, launching and scaling business and ideas, looking at tech ID um, and IP interaction, and then engagement with membership. And so um, we're, we're really gonna use these organizational development tools in a way that I believe will address any of the needs and interests that people identified when you registered. And again, I'm gonna give you copies of these slides so you don't need to worry about taking screenshots or writing down notes. All of this is gonna be provided to you. And this slide in particular, I draw from what's called improvement science. And I'll give you a link to information on improvement science. And it's this concept, this idea that your system is perfectly designed to achieve the results you're getting. So if we want to increase membership, but we see membership engagement dwindling, what we're doing in our organization is directly causing whatever that type of membership engagement or membership numbers that we have. And so what we're doing your, your system is designed to get exactly what you're achieving. If you're happy with your system, and I work with lots of organizations, I've never met a single organization that says we're doing exactly 100% perfect because that's part of the nature of what we're doing. We're always reinventing, reimagining, we're taking what we have that is a good product and, and we're enhancing it. We're finding areas that we know that we want to increase. Maybe programming needs to be revised. Maybe we need to provide to development to our leadership board, whatever that might be. Um, and so we want to start thinking about how can we reimagine the system. I find it's best for these types of workshops for you to be able to write something down. Now, my 15 year old hates writing anything down. His handwriting's well, you can't read it. I can't even say that word right now. Clearly I need my third cup of coffee. Yeah, words are not working there. Um, so you can type on your computer or you can write something down. There, there is research that shows that kinesthetic connection between thinking, writing, putting it down. So if you wanna take 10 seconds, if you don't have anything to write anything down with, grab it. Okay. All right, Mark has that. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna do a two-part exercise here. And this is a heads up to Mark as we go into breakouts, but not quite yet. And this is one of your tools that we're going to address in a couple of minutes. I want you to think about, and this is what, what I want you to write down, almost in categories and buckets. If we were in person, and I have a tool for this, I'm going to include it in your handout, how you can have this as a, as, a, as a document. Now, those of you who are working in a virtual space, a Google Doc is great. You can create a shared Google Doc where you can do this with your organization across the board, and I can show you how to do that in a different setting. But I want you to think about what are the things that you do well in your organization, not you personally, so not Nancy or Sharon, but what does the Strom Entrepreneurial Center do well? What are dreams, things that you wish would exist? And what are things that could be better? So I want you to take just a minute, I'm gonna stop talking and I want you to write down some ideas.
Okay, so that was a minute and I'm going to make one a couple comments. One, silence in the Zoom setting is kind of weird. I think we're still getting used to it. Um, two, I know that this was not enough time for you all to work on this, but I want to I want to say sometimes when I work with organizations, I might I might give this to each person in advance. The challenge of giving it to each person in advance to fill out is that sometimes people get together and they talk about this. And I really want people to come fresh when I'm working in a group, small or large. And then it's a healthy exercise. And this is almost like a pre-tool, you know, a bonus tool in a sense to write everything down. We have to get things out of our head and onto paper, onto sticky notes that I have on the wall here. You have to have some place where you're able to identify these things you do well, things you wanna change, these dreams, these wishes. Otherwise, you're gonna wake up at three in the morning and think about these. We have to put them somewhere so they're not taking up space in our head. And also, if we're working in an organization with multiple people, an association, we need to have some common understanding of the direction with which we wanna go. Now, I wanna ask you, what's the role of creativity Activity in your organization and it's an, it's an interesting sometimes controversial question because sometimes people go well we don't need to be creative but what I'm going to challenge you to think about is how creative are you all and how do we promote creativity because this enables us to think differently to reimagine what we're doing in order to address and achieve our, our hope for goals this is another kind of bonus tool I'm going to give you. And I love doing this exercise. I think some of you that I've worked with before have already seen this, or you might have seen it. I see a couple smiles. But I want you to take 30 seconds and I want you to write down on a piece of paper or on, on your computer how many different uses can you have for this paper clip? When I'm working with a group, I'll just say this item. But let's, I'm going to time you. How many different uses do you have for this particular item? All right, in the chat box, do you mind typing down some of the ideas that you came up with and putting them out there for the group? All right, so you can scan through what people are writing. And I love using this as a team building activity. And there's a couple different reasons for it. One, when I'm working with teams, what I would do is I would have an individual list out all the different ideas. And then I would pair them. Would, then I would put people into groups of two or three. And what you see is that as we start putting more ideas into the chat box, there's a power of community coming together. We can brainstorm and, and we might have maybe five ideas, but collectively we can have eight or 10. But then what happens as we make our groups larger and larger, we not only add to our list of possibilities, we start to build off of one another. We start to brainstorm off of one another. I find this particular exercise is quite helpful, especially for groups that might be a little contentious. You know, sometimes we have boards and groups and we may not necessarily all see eye to eye and we're trying to really convince people about the power of community and the power of collaboration. This is what I call third point. It's not me, it's not you. It's this exercise that we're working on. And this is an exercise 
exercise where we can think about the power of possibility, the power of brainstorming, the power of collective community. And we can do this with any type of object. And then you could say, hey, well, what are some other objects you might want to use to think about possibilities and functions? And so, yeah, it's not about organizations per se, but it is about organizational development, harnessing the power of creativity. And one of the reasons, other reasons why I like this activity when we're challenging people to really start to change the status quo is we can refer back to, there are lots of different ways to look at this paperclip. There are lots of different ways to look at what we're doing in our own organization. We can be introspective and we can also show how our mindsets changed about the use of this particular item by listening to other people. Because sometimes when we interject a little bit more controversial topic, maybe related to organizational change, doing things a little bit differently, um, just attacking that from the beginning is hard. But having something like this where nobody's really connected to a paper clip, it's a little bit easier to have those organizational development conversations. So here's this tool, and this is tool one officially on the agenda, and I'll put the agenda back on here for those um, who just popped in after I put the link in there. And it says, how might we idea? And so um, let's go back into, let's go into your groups now, Mark. And I would like for you to talk about very quickly, let's just do a quick hi, you know, I'm Karen, that sort of thing, who you're with, the organization, and then share something that you guys do well. And then why are you here? What's a dream? What's a wish? What's a want? So let's go into the breakout groups. You're going to be invited to go in now. Again, share a little bit about who you are, wants and wishes and dreams and things that could be better. And then we're going to pop back into the main room. All right, here we go. Okay. So everyone should have an invite to join their breakout room. Great. Can you pop me into the a room? And then I think from there I can pop in and out. Okay, you're off to breakout room number one because I'm not very imaginative. So I think if we can put Sharon into a different group because the other folks didn't accept to um, to move. All right, I'm gonna Sharon. I'm gonna move you to breakout room number three. Yeah. Great, and Dan, Jerry, Emily, and Sandy. Um, if you wanted to just talk in here, we can have a conversation here rather than going back into the breakout group. Can you all hear us? And that's okay. We've got uh, the other conversations going on in the other room, so that should be good. So if so, I think maybe that person who just went into the other room. Um, oh, so Dan's just observing things. So I think the other person who just went into the other room in room one, that person might be, or maybe there are two people in there. They can okay, they can talk.
We'll give 90 more seconds and then we'll bring people back. It's just an opportunity for people to kind of go into a different space and talk for a little bit. I'll time it. Mark, have you all been having these other Zoom presentations? I'm sorry, you asked that again? Have you been having these other Zoom presentations with your organization? Oh yeah, absolutely. Pretty much since March, we, uh, we pivoted pretty quickly, um, stumbled a little bit, but uh, yeah, this is, this, this is our mode now. That's great, yeah, you can probably get different people who wouldn't normally be able to come. Yes, we can bring them back if you want. Alrighty, we'll do that. So, <clears throat> looks like there's a, so I've invited everybody back and the breakout rooms will self-close in about 50 seconds. Great. Nancy, are you spending much time on campus or are you work, working remotely? You're muted. Pretty much remotely, but about, you know, a couple times a week, I pick a time like, you know, late in the afternoon or not that there's anybody there anyway um, to, you know, go and work on stuff that I, you know, I need to space or computer or whatever, but I'm going to, you know, we, we've we put together a little plan to come back, um, Sharon and myself, and then David Perkins is going to be in our space. Um, so we have a plan for how we're going to, you know, have a, a lot more structured um, environment over there, you know, at least in the beginning. Great, great. Yeah, that'll be a whole new world. Yeah. Um, so Mark, do we have everybody back in the room? Well, the rooms are closed, so okay. everybody is either back or bailed. So. Okay, super. <laughs> You're ready to proceed. So what I have in front of you is this how might we, and I think there's a power and possibility. Oftentimes when we're thinking about concerns and, and um, that we have within our organizations, we like to say, well, we don't have people showing up to our meetings. We don't have enough members in our group. We don't have people who are participating. There's a lack of engagement. You know, we're just not getting the funding that we want, or, you know, it's a really big problem because I just don't know how to launch and scale my business or identify the right products. What, what I have found in working with organizations is just by flipping some of these challenges on its head, by turning it to the power of possibility using a how might we statement, it helps reframe the conversation. And let me tell you, I'm the most type A cynical person in the world, but, but just putting a how might we on the front of this reframes everything. And so the case, the challenge that we're going to be thinking about within the context over the next 60 or so minutes is how might we have better attendance at our stakeholder workshops? So it might be how might we have more people come to our professional development? How might we better engage uh, people that we want to join our organization? Because we know that if we're thinking about it from a volunteer association standpoint, stakeholders coming to events can then turn into volunteer leaders who then help lead events. It's the same thing within any organization. And essentially what we have is a coalition of the willing. How can we engage more people who are willing to be a part of what we're doing? And so 
um, I, I just wanted to share when I was working with some people at universities, when I was in person doing this, we would have this chart paper and these would be archival documents and we'd be able to reflect back to these. You can see that we had the challenges posted, we have the how might we, and I've worked with some organizations and basically they turn these posters into their possibility room. They, I will come back and, and this one place I've been working with them for three or four years and I have the worst handwriting in the world and, and the person who's kind of leading the effort there, he thinks it's the funniest thing because my handwriting is all over his office and it's just awful and I'm mortified. But you can see actually that is my bad handwriting right there. So um, anyway, it's, you can still read it. I'm going <laughs> to flip past through it. But I love putting these up and again, committing to paper, putting it in writing in part it's transparent. Everybody can see it. We all have this understanding. If anybody needs clarification, it's right there. And also we get it out of our heads. I have a big problem and that's why I have sticky notes everywhere. I like to walk around with everything in my head, but then we start to drop the ball or ideas do not get advanced or we don't have a timeline. And so putting it on paper puts it in front of it. I really believe in getting things done for those of you who have read that book and embrace that philosophy. We have to figure out how we can organize our work and advance the work that's really important. Also, and this is from this idea of design thinking, which I am drawing from design thinking, I'm drawing from improvement science, I'm drawing from organizational development. It's this idea of creating a project brief. So we know that we want to engage our stakeholders. We want to have the type of planning that will get stakeholders to come to our organization, get them to stay, and then for, and get them to then volunteer and become leaders in our organization. But we want to clarify, and I, and I will put the project brief into your tool packet that Mark's going to email out to everybody. We want to clarify the challenge. What is this 30,000 foot view? And project briefs can change. It's kind of like a strategic plan. Strategic plan should be living documents. Project briefs can change. What's the challenge? So we have this issue with recruiting people, of having engagement, of having people come to our organization. What are our thoughts? What do we think? What are the opportunities? Again, what's the power of possibility? What are the goals? What are measures of success? And I will say your, your success measures will change as we advance along this, what, what I'm gonna talk about in the workshop is we think about root cause analysis, but at least putting something to paper to understand these challenges. <laughs> so what I wanna talk about is a way to identify the potential issues that we need to address. There's a habit in organizations in that we identify the problem and then we come up with the solution to address the problem in the same session. And this is a pitfall and it just causes cycles of challenges because oftentimes these solutions are created through our own lens. And I talk about lenses and this is another kind of bonus tool. And when you think about lenses, if I were to go up to, let's say a church and I look through a stained glass window, when I look through the color blue, the entire church is going to be tented with that color blue. But if Destiny looks through a yellow, what she sees is the same landscape, the same picture I see, but it's a different color. Bill may look at it through green, and so it's tented with green. So we all have these different lenses, these ways of thinking that's guided by our background, our experiences, our upbringing, what we've um, engaged in through our work. And so we all bring this to bear but if it's just one or two people coming up with a solution immediately, we might ignore all the potential causes to this challenge, and then we might come up with a solution. Oh, background music there. I think Zoom should have background music in general. It just makes it a little bit more lively. Not a whatsoever. Um, there we go. <laughs> um, and so. So what, what a fishbone diagram does, and some of you may have seen fishbone diagrams before, they're Pareto diagram, no, they're, yeah, Ishikawa diagrams, excuse me. And so I'll provide links and resources to these. These are visual ways of thinking about what are the particular possible buckets that are affecting whatever it is that we want to address. So here's a couple examples. So we have this main problem and then we can bucket it into these different categories. Here's one that I have problems with in particular. And again, it's a good third point 
example to help people think about it, you're taking a blurry photo. Now, this is not my mother. My mother's an amazing photographer. I did not get any of those skill sets from her. But rather than just me saying, well, you know, it's the camera or it's just me, there's lots of different possibilities why there's a blurry photo. It could be the environment. It could be the hardware. I always blame the hardware. It could be the method. It could be the user. But then underneath of those users, there are potential root causes. And so you can see these spine, the spines of the fish going off and you see these different root causes. All of these possible root causes could be the reason why the blurry photo is happening. And so we want to explore each of these root causes and then we can create our solution, our prototype, our product. You know, for those of you who are here who are creating products, we want to be careful to not create a product that's for us, but nobody else is going to buy. So we want to ensure that if we're solving a problem, we're solving the right problem and people are going to purchase this. Um, and here's another example here. So you can just see these different slides, these different examples. And I'm gonna provide additional links so you can look at different um, fishbone diagrams. But in this case, we wanna look at better attendance at workshops. What, what do you think, and you could put this into a chat box or you could just talk out loud, what are particular buckets, possible buckets of why people may not come to our events? If we, yeah, Mark? Yeah, so I'll throw out a couple of them because I put on events, as we can tell. Um, one is uh, conflict with uh, work. You know, we, we do our stuff, some of it during traditional work hours, and that, that's a challenge. Uh, another bucket might be uh, travel considerations. Um, and, and the third one might be, um, you know, is it an interesting topic? Or, or, or just topic very generally. Great, thank you. So uh, what I wrote down is, so we, time, accessibility, topic, um, uninterested, value. Okay, so this, so these, these are great. And so some of those could be root causes, some of those, so I see connection, so topic and connection. So if we were to look at the topic itself, so let's, let's go down the spine of the topic a little bit. The value, the perception of it, maybe there's just not an interest of it. And so you can see how this, this one bucket, so maybe one of those blue things could be the topic, and we can go down those different ideas. But, but just from the brainstorming here, We've come up with, I think, four different categories, time, accessibility, topic, connection with people. And, and so you can see how maybe um, we might just immediately jump to one reason why we don't have this type of engagement. But first, organizations are complex. There often isn't just one reason why something isn't successful. There are multiple reasons. So again, these different lenses help us think about how might we reimagine what we're doing. But then we can also dig deeper into these particular topics. So one, one that I was thinking about was potential and current stakeholders. And I think it really was along the lines of that the, the idea that I was thinking was, again, the topic. Like maybe it wasn't interesting. The topic wasn't actually interesting to these stakeholders. Maybe it was the time and the accessibility. And so in, in thinking about this, you could go through the different spines to the fish and lay those out. And so an additional tool when you get to these, and let's, let's look a little bit more about the topic itself, is called the five whys. Now, um, I like to talk to groups when I work with them. It's kind of like thinking about talking to a five-year-old, right? Well, we can't get ice cream. Well, why not? Well, it's not the right time. Well, why not? Because usually we don't have ice cream at eight o'clock in the morning. Well, why not? Well, um, you know, and then you just go through these different whys until you get to the root cause of what that actual issue is. And there might be different pathways that you take with that. And so here's an example, got caught speeding, why you're late for work, you got up late, alarm clock didn't work, batteries are flat. I mean, yeah, batteries weren't working, forgot to replace them. So let's go through the cycle and then we can figure out you know, what, what was happening. And so here, here was my example, and I, I promise I didn't prime the pump, but I did think about and working with other groups uh, around the same types of areas about interest and, and capacity and, and building organizational capacity. So stakeholders aren't interested in attending. That was one of my blue spines. Why? Well, programming is designed by our board, 
without input by stakeholders. Well, why? Well, we've always offered programming this way and it worked in the past, but now it isn't. Well, why isn't it? Well, we heard that it's not resonating with our stakeholders. Well, why not? They want new and innovative programming. Well, why? It would be more interesting to them. So two things. One, this helps get to the root of it. Two, when you do this as a group, three, five, six people, you can have different whys and different insights. And so here's this one particular idea by going through these very simple processes, we know that we need to get some programming that's a bit more interesting and engaging to stakeholders. But we do this through a consensus building process. So let's say that Nancy knows that my programming was really boring, but she didn't want to come and tell me because she felt like I would get insulted and I would just, you know, go go away. But, but if we did this as a group, we could come to this group understanding, oh man, yeah, you know, the ideas I've been having, they're just stale. And we need to get a little bit more programming in there. Um, and so we get to this idea of how might we, how do we offer more innovative and engaging programming? So it goes from people just aren't showing up to what we're doing anymore to we need to have something more engaging. And so how do we identify the types of engaging work, the types of engaging workshops and programming that will get people to come to our organization? And it might be to get people to come to your business. It might get whatever it might be. So how do we get interest with people? And so it's this idea of discovery and empathy and really using a design thinking process. Now, I'm not gonna get into the ins and outs of design thinking. That's a whole nother workshop. And I will say sometimes I spend two or three days with organizations in a retreat format to really go through all of this. So again, you guys are getting a really fast overview of different parts of building organizational development and organizational capacity. But it's this idea of empathy and empathy enables us to discover and spark creativity, allowing us to be innovative in our approaches um, to our organizational challenges. So basically what this means is that if we want to understand how do we offer more innovative engaging and engaging programming, we talk to the people that we want to come to our organization. And it means that we need to identify core users. So who are the people who keep coming back? Who are the people that aren't coming? Let's go to other organizations and see what they are doing. Let's talk to other people. Does anybody have any examples of when they might have talked to others to learn about something that you wanted to change, that you wanted to revise? Any experiences with empathy, whether it's talking to people or observing or doing some research? You know, this is Jerry. I'm the uh, current president of the PMIHR. We've got about 1,400. We've got about 1,400 um, chapter members, and luckily we have a very good source uh, in our region. Five, we have 16 chapters, so and they, they vary anywhere from the DC chapter with 13,000 uh, members down to the um, Podunk, West Virginia branch that has 110. So what we do is um, we have a meeting every month. We call the parties and the president's meeting. So I had to mute you. Your mic's a little bit funky there. I'm gonna unmute. Let's try unmuting you and then see if that works again. Okay, is that any better? It is not really any better. I don't think so. Never mind, it's fine. <laughs> but so you're talking about within your organization, you can lean on those other chapters to provide Correct. feedback to you? Okay. Um, we have an example. I'm not sure if it's a phone or another device. So um, I'll give you an example. I, I've been working with high schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia to redesign what it is they do to deliver services to students. We've gone on site visits to other high schools. We've talked to teachers, we've talked to principals, we've talked to other leaders. Um, I've also been working with universities to think about redesign. How do they comprehensive re comprehensively reimagine what they're doing? We've gone on site visits to those universities. We might not necessarily be able to fly anywhere right now, but we can still log into other meetings and talk to people. Um, I see in the chat here, you formed a 
barter exchange and reached out to several minority owned businesses and the biggest problem was finances gave you an open door to give them the barter aspect, but for some reason it's hard to get them to understand the value. So um, perhaps that, that's your root cause, understanding the value of what it is that you are doing. And then we could reimagine your approach to that process. So I think right there is you, in, with the minority barter exchange, you, you really honed in on a root cause of the issue is how might we engage with these businesses to understand the value of this particular system or process. I'm, I'm working with another organization right now along cybersecurity and our biggest challenge is how to engage small businesses around the value of cybersecurity and having people who aren't directly connected to that business coming into the business because they're afraid of um, confidentiality or other pieces. But so it, it's building that trust. It's that those trust and relationship pieces. There's a lot of value in empathy. And so this is another tool that I want you to think about is how can we engage in this empathy process? So we're going to go back to how might we create these types of programming and workshops to better engage our stakeholders. We can do this through observing. We can look at analogous situations. So what are organizations that are similar to ours? We can talk to people. I, I truly believe most people will talk to you. It's just a matter of picking up the phone or sending an email. And when I talk about interviews, it's not long interviews. It's, it's these short five, 10, 15 minute conversations that can give you a wealth of information. And then just engaging in research. And one of the really nice things about these partnerships with Old Dominion is that we have research opportunities. We have our library that we can help get you access to. We have people on campus who can help you think about the different nuances of your organization and to help provide some of the research type of experience that might be a little bit more difficult just in terms of access and entry. Um, so I want to show a really quick video that, that really talks about the power of empathy. And this is about two minutes. And, um, and again, this is a third point type of experience. It's not me, it's not you. It's probably not your business that, that you all are here for. But when we're talking with our board or our leadership, our organization members that we might say, hey, you know, I need you, Bill, to go out or, or Larry to go and talk to some other people. Here, here's a reason why. So let me show you this really quick video here. And if you can't hear it, let me know. About 10 years ago, we got approached by one of the largest uh, oral health care companies in America, a company you've probably heard of called Oral-B, and they said, look, we'd like a new kid's toothbrush because ours is starting to get commoditized. It looks like a lot of kids' toothbrushes out there, and you can't have that. We want to be special, right? So we say, okay, we'll do this. We want to go out in the field and do some field research. And they're kind of not sure about that. Like, it's not rocket science. We're talking about kids brushing their teeth. How hard could that be, right? They would really like us to stop fooling around and start designing, right? But we want to go through this process, this observation process, because we think almost always you can spot opportunities. And so we go out, and we're on like the first day of observations, and we make a small discovery. Small discovery we make is that every kid's toothbrush in the history of the world has had the same implicit assumption. It's a logical assumption, it just isn't exactly right, which is the assumption always was parents have big hands, kids have small hands, and so when you want to make the kid's version, make it like the parent's brush, only smaller and skinnier. Perfectly logical, until you go out in the field, until you actually watch humans, little tiny humans, brushing their teeth. And what you notice right away, you get a five-year-old boy brushing his teeth, He's not holding his toothbrush in his fingertips the way mom and dad do. He's fisting it. He's holding it like this because he doesn't have the dexterity. He doesn't have the fine motor controls that his parents have. And so he's got to hold it like this. In fact, the other thing he does is he holds the brush too far up very frequently. And so he's punching himself in the face as he's trying to brush his teeth. And we solved that problem too. But the main thing was, came back in the field and said, uh-oh, kids don't need little skinny toothbrushes kids need big fat toothbrushes, right? Let's make them big fat squishy toothbrushes. And you may have noticed now every toothbrush company in the world makes these, but our, our client reports that after we made that little tiny discovery out in the field, sitting in a bathroom watching a five-year-old boy brush his teeth, 
they had the best selling kids toothbrush in the world for 18 months. So when you think about power, when you think about you know, credibility, if you could go out in the field and do that observation and come up with that finding and your company, your organization was the best in its field for 18 months afterwards, would that be worth it? I think that would be worth it. And so that's this message about think like a traveler, be an anthropologist, use your powers of observation, have that part of your brain turned up as high as you can uh, all, all along. So what I would suggest is as you think about this high level challenge that you have in this case is how might we engage more people in our programming? How might we create more engaging workshops and programming opportunities to really take, a, take some time, and I don't mean six months, that's kind of like higher ed phase, right? But maybe just take a week at least and, and move a little bit slower to move fast. We want to talk to, we want to, talk to um, other people. We want to ask thoughtful questions. We want to understand from them. We want to engage in observations. And, and we can observe in different ways, even in this Zoom setting. Um, and then I, I had a question about usefulness of analogous organizations. I think it's really helpful to look at organizations who are like yours that are being successful and to learn from their areas of success. And it may be that there are some lessons that you can replicate or you can modify. Sometimes you can look at other organizations that also aren't being successful and you can zero in maybe even more clearly than in your own organization about the challenges that they are experiencing. Sometimes it's better, it's easier to be a Monday morning quarterback with other organizations. And so I think that that's quite helpful. And then, so again, this is another tool, is in your empathy process, we can't have it all in our heads. And what right now, what I'm finding organizations are doing is mostly they, they might be using Microsoft Teams or using a Google Drive, and you'll have all of these lists. And so who are the people that you might wanna to talk to? Both a, a type of person and then specific people that you can talk with. Who are, who are those people? Where are places that you might want to go? And again, codifying this, putting into paper, and I, and I like this quote in the field of observation, chance only favors the prepared mind. You know, we, we might think things um, happen serendipitously, but it really comes through preparation and preparation and preparation. And so we have to be prepared in order to make those successful changes. So those of you who are familiar with design thinking, I'm skipping over a whole bunch here and I'm jumping from talking to people and, I, and I'm completely cutting out because I'm paying attention to time here. The whole idea of theming out your lessons learned because you do need to theme out from these conversations. You need to create these ideas. You go through ideation. But let's say you've talked with people, you, you've realized that your programming is not engaging because you haven't talked to your stakeholders and your stakeholder demographics have changed. Let's say that you are still planning for people who were in your organization five years ago and things are different now. The way that we reach people is different. I know for us in reaching our own students, nobody wants to read anything. They wanna see quick soundbite videos and maybe that's the case as well. Maybe we are advertising what we're doing on Facebook but nobody's looking at Facebook. So it's that type of thing. So, so what we've done a year, two, five years ago may have changed and you've come up with this idea or these ideas. What I'm going to caution you to do is to not invest all of your money into this one or two into this one idea or these two ideas, because again, that's time, that's money, it's it's the human resource allocation. We want to test out these ideas to make sure that they are viable, and you can test these prototypes out whether it's just shopping around an idea. It might be on a template or it might be testing out a workshop with a small number of people. But you wanna think about how can you test these ideas before you invest the time, the, the money, the human resource into these particular engagement activities. We don't wanna have a one year rollout for your membership drive when at the end of the day, it's not actually going to meet the needs of your stakeholders. Um, so, and, and, and this gets to the last of our tools here is thinking about continuous improvement. 
And the questions that we want to ask ourselves is what problem are you trying to solve? What changes might you introduce and why? And how do you know that a change is actually an improvement? And that's a good question that I don't always see organizations asking themselves. How do I know that what I do is actually going to move the needle on, on, on our organization? Is it attendance at events? Is it transitioning attendees to volunteers and then volunteers to leadership? Um, how, do we, how have we written this down? How do we know that we are measuring it? And, and it doesn't need to be to the point where you hire an evaluator. You can put down practical measures, but um, you know, I'm kind of harping on this because I've seen so many organizations put in initiatives, but there's no metrics of success. I remember this one organization that um, was working with a colleague and had asked her to evaluate the efficacy of this particular grant initiative. And so she went to them and said, okay, well, what are your goals and objectives? Well, um, this is the overview of our, of our grant. Well, I need to know what you're measuring. What is it that you're actually trying to accomplish? And so sometimes we just have to have a lot of dialogue around that. What, what I will put forward is sometimes it's healthy to have an external facilitator to come in and guide these conversations for your organization because what we do is really personal. We're deeply connected to our organization. And sometimes those feelings and emotions might color the way that we approach our work. And so having somebody who's a third party who can help guide that process to facilitate it, I think is quite helpful, especially if you're looking at making some changes that are just vastly different from the core of what you've been doing in the past. And the other piece is, honestly, sometimes it's just nice to have someone come in and do it. It takes the heavy lift off of you and you can be a part of that as well. And it's whether there's two people in your organization or there's 1,500, there's 10,000, it's just helpful to have someone come in and work with you. And so the last tool as a part of this continuous improvement that I'm gonna lay over here is your model for improvement. Again, I just talked about what are you trying to accomplish? Put down whatever that goal is on paper. How do you know a change is an improvement and what change can we make that will result in improvement? So that is your idea. So whether it's that one year kind of more innovative programming, whatever it is, maybe you do programming seven o'clock at night, maybe you have 7.30 in the morning coffee clutches that where people can have that in a Zoom environment before they go on to their day. How do you know that's gonna move the needle? but we want to measure the success and creating a plan for improvement. And this is drawing from improvement science in particular. And these are called PDSA cycles. And sometimes people have had PDCA cycles. Those of you in the health industry, this should be really familiar. The Institute for Health Improvement um, has a lot of research around this. And I'll say that really health sciences has been the field that has moved the needle in these PDSA processes in this organizational growth and continuous improvement because we want that in the health sciences field and this should be what we're doing in any organization. So we have this idea, this prototype that you created as an ongoing process of empathy. We know we need to change our programming. We've talked to all of these different people. We've observed analogous situations. We've engaged in research. We've identified really that core root cause. We've come up with some sort of idea. So now let's test it out. Let's plan it. What are we hoping to learn from deploying this? So I know like Mark, for example, he has very clear goals for his organization. He has a plan, he has a process, and I know he's gonna go through and evaluate the efficacy of this initiative. You'll probably give him some feedback on the value of your time here today and the utility of the work. And he'll make changes based upon that feedback. So you make these incremental changes based upon this iterative feedback. You have a plan, you do the plan and you're collecting data. And I'm not talking about collecting complicated data. It could be, but it could just be anecdotal. These are called practical measures. These are useful measures that you can actually collect as a part of the process. And then you take those data, you study it, you make improvements. And I think it's always helpful to have at least a couple people who are a part of this process. Probably isn't helpful to have 30 people because sometimes too many cooks in the kitchen ruin the batch of food. Um, that's my excuse at home, which is why I leave the kitchen and let other people cook for me because I'm not good anyways with that. And then you act and you have these iterative change cycles. So you make these incremental changes because sometimes 
when we test out an idea and it doesn't work, it's not because it was a bad idea. Maybe there was some other piece to the implementation that just didn't work at the time. Maybe it was the best programming idea in the world, but we forgot to check one of our competing associations where we know we have a shared membership base and they too had something on the same night, just coincidentally, and they had planned it before ours and, and our membership potential went over there. And so our idea was great, but maybe the timing was poor. And that's why we need to study all these different possibilities because we also want, don't want to destroy an idea simply because maybe we didn't get the turnout that we wanted. So again, I think having these PDSA cycles are quite helpful. Putting this to paper so that we can study it is going to be quite important too. Um, so I promised Mark 90 minutes and we're at 62. I don't want you to feel shortchanged. Um, I'm gonna open it up for any specific questions. And then I feel like I threw a lot of information out at you, a lot of tools. Um, I know Mark can provide my email. I want you to consider me as a resource. I'm volunteering ODU because ODU is here too. Um, I'm quite fortunate to work at an institution that provides all of the support and is really dedicated to helping the Hampton Roads area and Virginia at large and to consider us as a resource. So I'm gonna pause here and see if you all have any thoughts or comments, questions. Yeah, Bill. Okay, yeah, so um, <clears throat> could you comment on the thing, the, the human dynamics? Um, Cause a lot of, I find it very common, I think a lot of folks do, you have a good plan. If just the, the I had the right people that would listen or something like that, it would just go great. But unfortunately, we don't have the right people in this group because this or that. I'm just generalizing. But um, how do you how do you approach the human dynamics of the meetings and getting everybody on the same page or even get to share doing the brainstorming and such like that? The um, the forming, storming, and norming I guess part of it. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and um, you know, I hate answers that say it depends, but sometimes it depends upon the organization. But to give a, a general overview, I think sometimes people try to rush into collaboration without doing that storming, norming, forming the whole square type of approach. I think um, when, when I have worked within organizations like that, as well as when I've been called in to support it, I am highly protocoled at the beginning. So if I know that we might have some interpersonal dynamics, I lean on the protocol itself. And I'll even go back to, um, so this is where maybe having an external facilitator coming in and having the co-creation of collaborative norms, whether or not people adhere to them. I mean, I'm realistic, like sometimes even co-collaboration of norms, you might deviate. But I, there, there are some, and I can, I can put these into the notes too. There are some norms of collaboration, I just, Put my pen somewhere but um i can put in the norms of collaboration and this is from thinking collaborative with adaptive schools and i found those norms to be helpful and referencing back to those norms um you know i'm i'm in a group right now where i'm on a volunteer board and, and sometimes we agree to things and then you know a month later everybody comes back and it's the same conversation and so i think being highly heavily protocoled, I think having agendas and notes on paper, somebody has to be the chief cat herder. And, you know, especially when it's a coalition of the willing, we can't make anybody do anything. And so if we can make things as easy for people in terms of having the calendars and sending out appointment reminders and, and having that level of detail and organization, and then sometimes, I've just had to have those step aside conversations about what, what is it that you really want to do that could make you feel like your time here in the organization is valued. And, you know, like sometimes it's just giving people, I mean, I know I'm like that too. Sometimes you have a pet project and, and sometimes that project's not realistic, but maybe there's something that somebody really wants to do that she or he hasn't been able to in the past. And so part of it is it's just cultivating those personal relationships. Um, and sometimes it's, it's I, I know this sounds silly, but it's the cheesiness factor. Sometimes we get so worked up in 
the business aspect of it that we forget about the fun part of it and how do we infuse fun back into work I'll, I'll give you an example right now so I'm, I'm um, I took off I was program coordinator for our k-12 program for seven years I took off for a year to fill it, finish up my provost fellow position and now I'm coming back on board and I just know everybody needs to connect and with everything going on nobody wants to have another zoom meeting for an hour and a half you know and try to do team building so we're doing an airbnb online sandwich making experience i've done it before i tested it out and and what i love about that it has the analogy of every like the sandwich is different right you've got bread and meats and cheeses and lettuce and, and all of that but you put it together i mean you have these really weird funky pieces and it comes together and it's an amazing delicious sandwich and so i'm going to try to use that as an analogy for our own organization we're going to have about 30 people online so i'll be able to reference back to that sandwich making experience for the course of the upcoming year as as an anchor and so again it's not me it's not you it's this third point anchor um, but I'll circle back to when I come in, circle back to, I keep on saying that, drives my husband nuts. But um, when I come into organizations as an external facilitator, I am just protocoled all the way. And, and then as we get more comfortable and, and maybe that tension of commitment has lessened where people are a little bit tense or maybe they're not pulling their weight, um, once they start to all kind of come into this uniform vision and we're aligned together, you know, like we're not cross-purposing, we can take away some of that protocol because it gets to be laborious if every time you know you're protocoled for a whole year that then becomes really taxing on you is that more information than you wanted okay yeah i don't know if bill's uh, thumbs up meant i want more i want more or <laughs> i'm satisfied we'll, 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 we'll no, was, and if i couldn't get to the mute button quick enough but no it's very good <laughs> okay thanks thanks um, hey, Karen, I, I've got a, I got a quick question. Well, maybe it's, it's a quick question. You determine the length of the answer. I'm just thinking specifically about the fishbone yeah. um, tool um, and using that in a group setting. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about facilitation of that. I, I, you know, I don't want to speak for everybody, but the, the concepts of, of how information is um, organized you know by you know you know possible contributors to the solution or to the problem or whatever yeah i, I get that but I, I have a struggle trying to figure out how we get a group of people together to work on that given the if you will the precision of that diagram in contrast to you know big loose mind map or brainstorming so so much for my question being quick <laughs> yeah so a, a couple questions and i had a question in the in the chat about fishbone getting all the way to the pdsa cycle i don't believe so so what do i think i think that anything we're talking about is made up by somebody everything is a construct of somebody right we we create these and so the fishbone is the creation of a person and it's been adopted, Lean Six, Six Sigma, you know, all of these different types of efficiency, organizational efficiency strategies. Um, I, it's like a PowerPoint to me, you know, it's, it's just a gentle suggestion. And um, I, I realized I didn't include some slides in here. I had some pictures of how I actually use the fishbone in person. So, um, and they were from faculty members and, you know, faculty, we're, we're curious, people you know strong willed and so what i ended up doing was we came to a general consensus and i and i'm thinking about this one faculty in particular one group and it's about 12 people and i think I, I had like three different universities at the same time doing this and this one in particular um they're a little headstrong strong and so we did agree on the categories um you know as students fat, whatever and, and i gave some gentle suggestions about what the categories were and then i actually broke them up into smaller groups and me and we had teams of two or three brainstorming potential causes to each of those blue categories here and then what i did was i then had them rotate and look at each of the chart paper and they could have sticky notes and they could make suggestions 
they could have some agreements, disagreements. And then I, I facilitated basically a conversation around coming to some uniform agreement. Well, can we see these categories collapsing together? That's why I like sticky notes sometimes because you can move them around. And, and the, there were, it was chart paper with sticky notes. And so I do find what you're saying, Mark, it's a little difficult to use this fishbone in a static way especially in an online environment. I'll tell you that as well. I find that there's lots of like easy tools to use Fishbone online, but I haven't found any yet, to be honest with you. And so I, 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 you can just use a brainstorming chart, like maybe Google Docs. And so somebody needs to collapse the categories. That's the way that I've done that. I mean, basically it's just a brain, it's, it's another way of brainstorming. I think it's just a different approach to it in, in my sense. Makes sense. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. And then, and then a question was, how do you get from the fishbone to the PDSA cycle? And that's a great question. What, what I like to use with the fishbone is it really helps me honestly get to what might be a couple of the potential root causes. And then it guides me in the empathy process. So let's say that, and, and I don't think that, I mean, I think that we can look at different spines and think about there's a couple issues that might be more pressing than others, but we need to use that as a way to ask questions in the empathy process um, and to observe. And so that's what we've really used as a way to guide our work. Now, one of the ways that we've used the fishbone before is we think about creating different products and solutions is you might be in an organization that has clear bifurcated pieces. So you might have curriculum, you might have a leadership board, you might have something. It's not to say they're not connected and that's the messiness of the process is there might be some overlap. You probably are going to create a prototype or a solution that's going to cut across different pieces of this fishbone. But I think more so when you, and I encourage people to create a protocol for when you're talking to people, because if I talk to someone and Destiny talks to another person and Dan talks to another person, but we all ask different questions, when we come back as a group, it's difficult for us to make meaning of the data we collected if we're all asking different questions. And the same piece when going from the fishbone to empathy, if we don't have some agreement as to who is speaking to different people, we could all go to Ben and we're all talking to Ben and the Ben just gets frustrated and leaves the association because he's getting inundated with survey requests. And so having an agreement as to who you're going to connect with. Um, so then from there you create whatever idea based upon all that data. And I think what's nice with the fishbone piece too is you can you can have a prototype and you can circle back to your fishbone or the data you've collected from your interviews and your research and you could say did this idea is the prototype really connected to these data points that we collected or did we still create something that we want so it's this check to make sure that what we're designing so if we have programming is it really something for me because i like bluegrass I really just wanted to have a bluegrass concert when somebody else just really wanted to have a jazz concert, you know, and, and the stakeholders wanted jazz, but I wanted bluegrass. Hi, this is, this is Jerry. Um, I would offer to you uh, in, in my line of work, project managers, we use the Ishikawa uh, quite a lot. <clears throat> Traditionally it's, um, it, it's more for product design and quality defect prevention. But if you, if you pull back, if you look at each one of these as a separate entity, if you pull back, uh, another very, very valuable tool is a scatter chart. <clears throat> and with the scatter chart, you can adjust your, your means, your high acceptable, low acceptable, and anything that any of those, and they represent what you were just calling on data points. And then with each one of those, and you usually have at least two on the axis. Um, but if you go back to that scatter chart and you can select one data point and then use the Ishikawa, it, it's so much easier to narrow it down on it. And now, again, this is, this is as it relates to, you know, product design and quality defect uh, prevention. Yeah, that's great. That's super helpful too. And I'll, I'll be sure to include that in the materials as well. Um, so thank, thank you. Yeah. And so, 
that that would be the the slide here and I think right here as as well too. So Jerry has now volunteered to serve as a resource for this as as well. And so I and I want to and I want to point this out to so the power of conversation. And I, I really believe too the solutions in the room and everybody brings a unique skill set and background and experience. And so in this sense, we would be able to lean on Jerry with his experience to really bring that to bear and think about how might we then translate that into our particular association process and to think about who amongst your group when you go back to your organization could also contribute. And then I think I would, I would circle that back to Bill's question about building your team and, and having your team collaborate. I, I often encourage, and, and this is really when I'm working with K-12 and um, with some of the businesses, but those people who are on your team, what is their background? And, and, and what skill sets do they have that you might not necessarily realize that they have? And then how can we leverage that expertise, both to, to grow the work that we're doing, but then to cultivate their own interest and capacity in the organization? Because everybody likes to have acknowledgement and to feel valued. And um, so thinking about how can we help you know get them to help in in different ways too so thank you right. anybody else other questions for karen karen i did see a comment um in the in the chat box about about our resources yeah absolutely um Love to get resources about current membership engaged. Yeah. Oh, I love the walking billboard idea. I, I appreciate that. And so I'm going to copy all of the chat that I've gotten thus far. And if you're like me, you kind of have windshield conversations, although not a lot of us are driving around home anymore. So I don't know, you might have afternoon coffee or wine glass reflection conversations later in the evening. And there's something that you want to follow up on. So if you could email Mark and he can forward those to me and um, I will try to get those resources to you or I might lean on Sharon and Nancy with the Sturm Entrepreneurial Center if that's out of my purview and, and we can follow up with you. Thank you for your time. It's so nice to be able to work with you all. I love doing this. I wish we could be in person, but you know, we're in the comfort of our own homes. So I guess that's good too. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, thanks everybody um, for showing up today and actively participating. And also a special shout out. Thanks uh, to Nancy and Sharon and Emily from uh, Old Dominion University. Um, I didn't mention this before, but ODU is a very strong partner of, um, of the Professional Development Consortium of Hampton Roads. Um, we lean <laughs> on, on ODU um, for resources such as speakers and space and occasional sponsorship. And uh, between the Strong Entrepreneurial Center and the uh, Strong Business College, um, we just really have incredible support um, uh, in, in terms of uh, not only the things I mentioned before, but also uh, uh, viability and credibility really for our curriculum. Um, so, you know, as, as a tiny little educational institution of our own, it's, uh, it's great that we've got big brother and big sister uh, <laughs> helping us out. So truly, truly appreciate everything that ODU has uh, been doing uh, to support uh, PBCHR's mission. So folks, um, I have one last request for you. Um, and this is, uh, if you will, if you jump over to your um, chat box, I'm going to put a link in there, hopefully. There we go. Um, for a quick two minute survey, um, <clears throat> just a few questions. So if you could go ahead and click on that now and as Karen mentioned before, um, we're, we're very big here about measuring and feedback so we can um, uh, twist the future to, to, to be of, of even greater value to you. So I, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, 
I'll, I'll leave this open. Um, well, the, the survey is open, so go ahead and click away at this. I think I called out um, um, Nancy instead of Karen, which is really odd for me because I'm staring right at her picture. So, so thank you, Karen, <laughs> for, for your presentation today. Nancy, thank you for that gentle nudge <laughs> about, about what I did there. So again, folks, uh, please take the survey. We generally meet on, when, on, on the second Wednesday of every month. We've got something going on, usually in the afternoon. Sometimes it's six o'clock in the evening. Um, you'll receive on Friday, um, a little bit before noon, you'll get an email um, that will point you to all the resources that Karen promised. Um, and there'll be some information there about our next few upcoming events. So you can go ahead and click through and register or share with your friends. Um, everybody's welcome. And if you have uh, any other feedback, as uh, Karen mentioned, you can just email me back. Um, you got, I'm all over your, whatever event bright you respond to will get back to me. Um, so if there's anything else in particular you are looking for from Karen, um, or for me or from the consortium in general, um, that's your opportunity. So with that, uh, maybe one last round of applause for Karen or one of these and stuff like that.